pretty happy to actually be in a city like Shanghai. Actually, I'm based here. I've been here for 16 years myself. I feel like I've seen the whole city grow. So for some of you have heard, I've seen most of these buildings being constructed. Anyone that's been, been here that long certainly has. And for me, sustainability is very practical. Uh, it is about the cities and systems. I'm not really into polar bears. I don't really care what carbon footprint was. Although apparently, if you scan this app, you get, you get carbon credits, right? Yeah. So you can bring it down that way. But we really, at Collective and myself, really look at the systems of delivery and economy to seven and a half, eight billion people in 2050. Uh, that's our big goal, mission, thing we're trying to constantly try to understand because we need food, we need happiness, of course, we need energy, jobs. We need all these systems to work for a city to work. And it's not to say that the two and a half billion not living in cities aren't important, but it's going to be the seven and a half billion people in the cities that are going to determine whether or not we have anything left to even fight over. And about two years ago, I got really interested in what's happening to the waste in the city. And partly I've been watching you know, these guys run around. So myself and a number of my staff, we all started to run around the city trying to figure out where are they going? What are they, what's their economy look like? What materials are going through? Where do those things go? And we created this map. Now, to keep a, a short story short, I'm not gonna get into the information. We do have a report on our website that's about 30 pages long. The details actually by material what happens. But we looked at plastic, paper, metals. We've got a food report coming out soon, right, too? Okay, no pressure. Um, and uh, it's actually all on me right now. Um, we basically looked at every waste we can uh, We followed about 75, 80 shipments. And the most interesting thing about this whole thing is that only two shipments ever left the city limits. Only two things ever left the city limits, which means the city itself is eating it up in their economy. The processing centers are actually not like what you think of in the West, where we send the recycling to a sort of facility, get sorted, and then sent to China, which we'll talk about in a second but actually gets sent to a place like this, which is a paper and pulp factory to the south of the city. We found three that are of similar size. To give you an estimate, like, so you figure this out, that's a truck, like an 18-wheel massive truck, and this is all recycled paper packaging coming in. Uh, we talked to that company, basically it takes three days for something to go from here, all the way through the process and back out as a new box. Pretty interesting. I mean, it's, it's not 100%. It's definitely not a clean process if you're looking at water. It requires a lot of energy. But progress is being made. The resources are not being put into a landfill, thrown out in the ocean on purpose. Yeah. Which certainly for not on purpose. But the economy around waste for us was just fascinating. Uh, the people involved, you know, we learned how much money they make, how they trade, what information they're using, how quickly they move through the system. And it really, it's, it's counterintuitive because if you're coming from the West, what is her reduce, reuse, recycle, use the blue bin, whatever, and you do the world a bunch of good. What we're finding out is actually these guys are the most efficient recyclers in the world right now for valuable materials. And there's a, I'm sure a lot of these individuals talk more about that. But for years, the Western way was actually to send a lot of it to China um, for recycling, or for reprocessing. And that's something that people will be talking about next. So with that, I'm going to hand off to see whose last name is me, not Mom. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'll give it to her, because she's been working really on understanding the regulations and the impacts of the new ban that came in place, and also probably quite a surprise. Hello, everyone. My name is Sihi, and I'm an analyst at Collective Responsibility. I'm super excited today to talk about China's waste ban, not because I'm going to present in front of my boss, <laughs> but in fact, because this is like a really interesting time to talk about waste in China and also globally. And really like what Rich has like taught you about, like all the China's waste ecosystem lays the foundation for what I'm going to present next, which is to think about waste in the global context and think about what role China has been playing in the global waste trade. So let's look. Okay, before I start, I just want to show you like film numbers. 1.7 billion metric tons. That's the amount of steel we produced in 2015. I mean, the world has produced. And as you know, China is the world's largest steel producer, so accounting for half of the global total. Next, 410 million metric tons. That's the amount of 
paper and cardboard we have produced in 2016. And for plastic, we have 340 million metric tons. And China is also like the really the top producers of, for like 25% of paper and plastics came from China. So this is only like three examples of the massive amount of materials we have produced to really feed the global consumption needs. But how are we going to deal with all the waste once we're done using them? Look at this example of like global plastic waste generation and disposal. We are around like here and we already produce like 20 times more plastic than 50 years ago. And if the trend continues, we'll have like 25 billion metric tons of plastic waste. And how are we going to deal with it? As you can see, like a lot of them is discarded. And some goes to landfills, some goes to incinerators. And today, only like 10 to 20 percent is actually recycled. Oops. And if you're looking at this like global like waste trade map, it really tells you how the system works. In fact, in the West, we've been pushing like the problems offshore to China. So, how the system really functions? It's like. China has long been really served by the world's factories, and we like import a lot of like uh, the China export a lot of like consumer goods to all the Western countries. And every year, there's like a huge amount of shapes and containers loaded with all the consumer goods and export to like ports in America, Europe, and Asia. And you don't really want the ships to come back empty, right? So that's why. Like kind of like all the people started uh, like loaded all these containers with recycled materials. It serves really two purposes. Number one, it's, it's definitely cheaper than like processing all the recycled materials locally. And number two, it fits China with all the like virgin materials it needs for its manufacturing industries. And if you're looking at the like, top exporter countries, we see United States, Germany, UK, France, Italy, Canada. Well, Japan's like slightly different because of their geographic constraint. It can't really like process all the waste domestically, but we can really see the trends. And as I said, like really, the West has kind of been pushing all the waste problems offshore in China. And in 2016, China imported 43 million metric tons, and that's not even like completely. Because like I, I only include like four like top of the imported materials. That's like paper, plastic, uh, paper. That's like more than 28 million metric tons. Plastic, that's seven million. Aluminum and copper, five million. Steel and iron scraps, like two million. We have textile waste imports. We have e-waste import, and we have oh the list can go like the, the really the list can goes on. And collectively, this is like a 30. 37 billion US dollar business. And if you're familiar with like data for, for like me, it's like the size of the GDP of a country like Bolivia. So this be really like a huge low tier business. And this all changed until China introduced the waste ban. So what is China's waste import ban really about? I'm sure a lot of you have read the news about that like, China start like starting January 1st this year. Oh, tech problems. <laughs> All right. So starting January 1st this year, China stopped the importation of 24 kinds of scrap and waste material that include like plastic and sorted waste paper and textile and venom slab. And what you may not know about is that this is like the only like the first step of China's waste ban. And just like four days ago, China announced another ban. Yeah, it's like you really follow the news because China's like Ministry of Ecology and Environment, which is like a former Ministry of Environmental Protection, announced that it will start like banning another further 62 kinds, which is starting December 1st this year. It will ban like waste hardware, ships, and compression part for waste autos, and like slag and then the industrial plastic scrap. And Starting like December 31st next year, there's a lot of like wood, cork, steel, metal, etc. And you think this is the end? Of course not. Like by 2020, China wants no more scrap material until for uh, unless for those that cannot be processed domestically. I'll give you just some seconds to take a photo. And 
Well, we will, we will have like probably like more announcements. So yeah, that's a see. It's really exciting time. That's why we kind of call it exciting time. Well, what's really the momentum behind China's waste map? What really drives China want to make it? It's a kind of sudden change. It's it's like like what like thirty seven billion dollars of business, and why change recently? And a lot of you may familiar because of the environmental protection reasons, right? In fact, this is like the the notification China sent to WB. I, I pulled it from their website, and I read through all the like the documents. I found like what China said is that we found a large amount of dirty waste or even hazardous waste are mixed in the solid waste that can be used as raw materials, and we need to protect China's environmental interests and people's health. Well, it kind of makes sense. Because you still remember like the, the the waste map we showed before, so a lot of, like there's are like individual scavengers and recyclers. They don't really operate like under like strict like, safe con safety control, environmental control. So that's why they don't really know how to like sort the waste uh, properly, thoroughly, and they sometimes they mix the waste with other waste, which not only contaminate the recycled material, but also like like inflict hazard on themselves. But really beyond that, I want to talk about the Made in China 2025. Any of you have heard of this? Well, it's kind of like a strategic plan which issued in May 2015 by the Chinese Premier. And it's, a, it's actually inspired by the Germany's Industrial 4.0. So it's like a really comprehensive initiative to help China to like move its industri like manufacturing industry off the supply chain. And the industries targeting are mostly high-tech industry. If you're looking at the list, there are like 10 top like uh, high, uh, industry of high priority, which are like aviation, automotives, or a lot of like, high-tech like robotics, medical care as well. So that's kind of like really the reasons, if you're like, I, I don't want to go back to the side, but just to remember like the, the waste scrap the China is targeting this year is all like industrial scrap waste. So it's like waste car, like pressure car with ships. That's why China wants to emerge like virgin material to be sourced domestically. It wants to have like full control for capacity when it's trying to like like build up its like supply chain or like trying to upgrade its like manufacturing industry. It doesn't want to be the world's dump site and it wants like a really like a high type advanced manufacturing industry. And that's why we say that like really like 2019 or like 2020 is not the end. Because when China wants to move to other industries, you may see this of like more make probably like more important than other kind of scrap materials. And well, what are some of the like most apparent impact? Of course, in the West, uh, like the recycling waste pot, like the recycling fee increases. Uh, I have a friend from Australia and the United States trying to call me at three in the morning and say, "Hey, see, do you know like our recycling fee is raised because China we spent?" I said, "Okay, you can see how really how desperate they are to write, to know about this China's waste that the impact is." Global is huge, and it really impacts not only business but also cities, and then to individuals. And next, I'm going to just briefly talk about like some impacts on industry. I won't really dive into details because you will hear really deep insights from our next speakers, really excellent speakers. So, but I do want to give an example of China's like the paper and pill industry. So you can see after the introduction of the waste bed starting. January this year, there's like a steep drop in the supply from the the, the waste paper and cardboard. It's almost like it's like from like was like 25, so 50, like but that's like measuring hour to almost nothing. You can really see how this the like the it's like huge drop for for from like very steady growth and then after import back, well everything changed. And because of like the kind of the demand supply demand change, the price also changed. I'm giving you the example of old corrugated cover or container, which like the something I showed in bars, you can recognize it. It's very common, like the all kind of used to package everything. And the price 
The freedom lap is the price of imported OCC, and after the import ban, it's kind of fluctuated a little bit, but then after the import ban, it drops. And for domestic source OCC, the price goes up. Not only because like China stopped importing, it really uh, kind of opened up the market for domestic source OCC, but also because China is really trying to like upgrade the recycling industry. And if you recall the, the chart, it has a, like the, the effect kind of ripples from the large, like for this one, maybe like paper mills to a, then the like smaller scale paper mill and then to the recycler or collectors who collect all the paper and cardboard and then to the individual collectors. That's kind of why we talk to the individual collector. They're so price sensitive because they know the market and they really understand it. And they even know more, like for, they know China's waste man, when I like talk to them, they're like, okay, that man, okay, I know. He's like so really confident. And that's why we say this, like the system is economic driven. And we believe that because of the system is economic driven, we we think that you can really drive like entrepreneurship, they drive really like uh, innovation, they drive solutions. And for China's waste man, it's kind of a, problem for cities to really to think about recycling practices, for business to close the loop, but it also presents a huge opportunities. So, and this one just want to show you that the, like really the impact of China's waste ban because there's no, I know like some of the countries trying to sell the, the scrap materials to other countries, but there's just no single market when compared to China, the one China. Like in terms of like like man, like a training capacity or this labor, etc. And if you want to learn more about waste, we will have like a event in May 16th. So these are are, are our company QR codes. So if you want to learn, we'll publish more like deeper insights into China's waste ban, like to analyze different its impact on different industry. So if it really interests you, just please don't forget to scan it and just or talk to my boss or me afterwards. And thank you. I hope you really enjoyed tonight. Uh, thank you very much, CE, me, and Andrich. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I think in general, CE is right. I think China's waste 